we are being reset. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even matter if there's not one big dramatic collapse, finale, kaboom. Um, we are in a slow motion train wreck. Mm -hmm. And do you think it'll be a smooth handover? In no, the I don't think, it's, I do you think? don't think. No, I don't think it's going to be smooth, but we can only play the course in front of us mm -hmm. as it's revealed to us and as we learn more. And even the, our enemies, the central bank, the leading financiers, they, they don't fully know what's going to happen either. Welcome to Gold Silver Pros, where you'll learn the ins and outs of the gold and silver markets. Searching for the best precious metals deal? Our affiliates are of the utmost trust, quality, and highest customer service in the industry. Shop with our trusted partner, Arc Silver. Access special deals on silver, gold, and platinum through our website or call 307 264 9441. Hey, everybody, this is Rob Keynes of goldsilverpros.com. We're recording this on July 20th, 2022. Should be out on the channel in a couple of days. And I called together a, a roundtable. I think it's going to be very interesting. It'll be a little bit different from our normal fare of talking about gold, silver, and just the markets. We're going to expand the discussion today over and around freedom and, and what that actually means. And I brought with me some uh, good speakers on the topic that uh, we've talked about this quite a few times in private. And I think uh, each of them has been on the channel before. So we'll start off with Jennifer Rankin, who has worked for Gold Silver Pros for quite some time and has uh, a background in uh, political science from Harvard University. We've got Jim Forsyth, who's a leader of Citizens for Sound Money and also Silverback Precious Metals. And we're also joined by Ian Everard, the owner of ARC. How are you guys doing today? Excellent. Great. Good. Thank you, Robin. You? Doing pretty well. So thank you guys for hopping on for this discussion. So we are going to talk about banksters and money. So that'll be good for people that, uh, you know, come to us for financial news. And we're going to start off with this interesting speech from a former governor of the Bank of England. And as you just... As described him Ian before the recording maybe you can describe him again who exactly was this guy and how powerful was he yeah so Montague Norman he was governor of the Bank of England from the 20s I think right through the Second World War so into the late mm -hmm. 40s uh, so a long long period and and comes comes from a family as well uh, both grandfathers on the maternal and paternal line were governors of the Bank of England mm -hmm. So yeah, d definitely hereditary. So very powerful at the time. It was the predominant, you know, bank in the world right before yeah. really the rise of the the Federal Reserve. So we wanted to read this quote, and then we, and we're going to kick the the meeting off with that, and we just want to talk about it. And, and anything that we get into on the subject is fair game. So the quote is, and this is part of a speech that he gave to the United States Bankers Association in New York City in 1924, as the governor of the Bank of England at the time. He says, capital must protect itself in every possible way, both by combination and legislation. Debts must be collected, mortgages foreclosed as rapidly as possible. When through the process of law, the common people lose their homes, they will become more docile and more easily governed through the strong arm of the government applied by a central power of wealth under leading financiers. These truths are well known among our principal men who are now engaged in forming an imperialism to govern the world by dividing the voter through the political party system, we can get them to expend their energies in fighting for questions of no importance. It is us by discreet action, we can secure for ourselves that which has been so well planned and so successfully accomplished. Um, Ian, I'll just open up with you. What are your thoughts on that speech? If you can oh my gosh. Well, just I a felt... quick view on that and we'll go to everybody else. <laughs> you, when I first read that, it made me so angry. Mm -hmm. um, because it's hidden in plain sight. They didn't even bother to hide it. It was a speech and obviously somebody wrote it down. It was recorded, it was printed in the Idaho Leader that year. It's been read twice in the Australian Parliament. So it's in the Australian Hansard, which is a guaranteed 100% accurate recording of what is said. So we know that's not been altered, it's not been manipulated. And it sounds familiar, doesn't it? To like, you'll own nothing and be happy. Very yeah, it sounds a lot like uh, Klaus Schwab, doesn't it? It's yeah. almost, almost the same thing about 100 years ago, talking about how they believe that they essentially should rule the world as an elite and then everybody else, you know, is be, would be subject to it. It's like the old royalty model. Not, not surprising 
the 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 Bank of England, you know, someone at the Bank of England would come out with that opinion, given their their royal history and their view on uh, royalty and an elite class over society. I would say it's older than that. It goes back to the Greeks. Yeah. Caesar said, if you want to be king of a democracy, you blame the peasants, divide the peasants, and confuse the peasants. Mm -hmm. And that's what he said was happening with the pol political party system. When you have parties, it distracts people from, you know, coming together and moving forward. Everybody's arguing their side, like a like you're arguing for a football team or cheering for a football team. Well, yeah, pluralism is a funny phenomena, but yeah, especially especially when um, there are entities that sort of exist in conjunction with it, or like, or really, what they want to do is manipulate it for their own benefit, right? So uh, we have a perfect example in the United States. It's called K Street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And what is K Street specifically? I mean, it's where all our lobbyists are, Capitol Hill, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, um, you know, you, it's, and it's perfectly legal. We never did anything about it, right? So we, mm -hmm. um, it's, it has its own infrastructure that it's developed and it's a, mm -hmm. and it's designed to influence those who we elect to represent us. Mm -hmm. And so when the money, represents you know where do they go they uh, there was a perf there was a quote and i don't remember what senator it was or congressman but they said lean to the green and they were not an environmentalist yeah <laughs> and lean to where the money's coming from yep so it's yep. interesting that, we, that that obviously is manifesting now in the united states we're the most powerful nation there's so much money that goes into the polit political process of contributions and donation donations and things do you think that they understood that back then, Ian, or what, what do you, what does the speech mean to you from back then and how close are we to what he's describing now? Well, we were closer than it was then and he was mm -hmm. boasting how successful it was already. And he doesn't say who their leading financiers are, but basically it clearly said they're having success in, in using the strong arm of the government. So the government is just a puppet being manipulated or controlled or blackmailed or whatever it is, any combination of those for the nefarious desires of these financial elite. And I don't think we even know their names. My suspicion is they're far wealthier than the, the people that we think are the richest people in the world. Uh -huh. And they're not going to be happy until they have it all. So hopefully they're going to be very unhappy and not get it all. <laughs> is it possible given current circumstances that the, the central banks could be working to the, together collusively for the next monetary system, or is that seem really far fetched that you could get anybody to agree? Because the first thing that people tell you is the politicians are basically inept, can't even get the most basic things done. But how could central banks work together? Or I would argue they would have to work together to coordinate policy for the given system. But but how did that infrastructure come about? Well, we know the Bank of International Settlement is doing extensive work on making all CBDCs interchangeable. So That's true. Mm -hmm. they'll just have dollar, pound, yen, euro, whatever it, in name, but it'll all, all be linked. So there'll be no floating exchange rates. Everything will be fixed, at wh whatever they say, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not conspiracy theory. The BIS are o uh, it's open. That, that they are work actively making sure all the systems are compatible. Yeah, and they came out with a bunch of standards in, in 2014 that were designed basically to unite the international yeah. banking system under the same financial regulations, uh, at least with regards to their liquidity ratios or solvency. But there's also a, a, a lot of other cooperation out there among international banks on policy so you see it on the, on their policies not only with central bank digital currencies but how they're easing they tend to ease at the same time they tend to take coordinated policy action so how did this come about jim how do we have we went from being an independent sovereign nation with no central bank now to having a central bank now to having like a mega central bank that seems to be influencing the independent sovereign central banks around the world how did we get here well how, how the u.s got here um because because what Ian's talking about, that the British, that that predates this. But, um, you know, it was in 1913 with the Federal Reserve Act. Um, definitely highly recommend people read The Creature from Jekyll Island to get an understanding of kind of, um, 
you just say conspiracy theory, but it's very pretty damn darn well documented um, with direct quotes and stuff. But, you know, people were getting more and more prosperous. They didn't need to borrow money, you know, but you'd buy stuff on layaway and the banks were seeing, you know, their revenues go down and they say, you know, we, we gotta, we gotta get control over this. Um, you know, and they, they of course always use fear, um, you know, fear, fear of banking failures or whatever to say, we need a central bank to protect the people. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that was the, you know, and then they passed it during a time, I think it was over Christmas or something and very few people yeah. were there. Um, and then at the same time, we get the, the income tax, you know, which is no, um, I don't think a, a coincidence. Um, you know, in, Central banks was something that we uh, fought against throughout our history. Um, you know, that was between Jefferson and Hamilton. They understood that when you consolidate and centralize power, you know, it corrupts things. Um, you can't have a free market with a central bank. In fact, it's one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto is to have a, a, a central bank. Um, yeah, and so 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 we got the Federal Reserve, and it's it's been downhill from there. Um, you know, they they created the Roaring Twenties by loose money po policies, and then that turned into the Great Depression. Um, yeah, then FDR confiscates gold, reprices it, mm -hmm. um, and then you know it makes it irredeemable for American citizens. But then it was redeemable overseas, and then you know the continued spending um, led to it becoming more and more fractional. Foreign countries redeeming their gold. Um, then 1971, Nixon severed the gold link because they couldn't, you know, they were all the money, all the gold was flowing out of, I say money, all the money. Yeah, all the real money was flowing out of the United States. And you, you were, I think when we talked before that we got on here, you were talking about, you know, this, this is a gold silver show, but we're going to talk, talk about freedom. Um, you know, gold and silver at the heart of freedom, you know, sound money is the very heart of freedom. You know, uh, every, every transaction you make, if half of that is a uh, fiat dollar, that essentially means, you know, all your transactions are essentially being controlled to a, a certain extent. Um, you know, the, the dollar is 50% of every transaction. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, if you, if you, if you want to be free, you, you know, I, I believe you have to adopt sound money and it's, it's probably, the most important thing when it comes to freedom, including, you know, government couldn't be as powerful as they are if they couldn't print the money. Um, they couldn't go into endless wars after wars if they couldn't print the money. Um, you know, think back to World War II and we had uh, the big bond drives to try to finance the war. Now you don't have to bother with that. You can just print the money for any war you want and not bother to press a button. It. Yeah, and issue yeah. credits through the computer system. Yeah. So I, I, we do talk a lot about the monetary side of things, the central bank and some of that. But there are other issues that we're dealing with in terms of, of freedom here in this country that we want to talk about as well. So I'll throw it back to Jennifer. A lot of what we often talk about, Jennifer, is like a crisis of the political system and how it doesn't align with the people. How, how is it that the political system is so tone deaf now to what the people want? And why are the politicians not able to, to provide what they need? Well, when you, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a, Gosh, okay, so it's a it's big and kind of complex, but yet it isn't in some ways, right? So the tone deaf, the reason they're tone deaf is because, you know, who funds the campaigns, right? Like, where does the money come from? If I, I made that statement before, lean to the green, and they didn't, that per particular representative was not an environmentalist, right? I mean, you know, that's, that's a, an issue that we, you know, we didn't, we didn't deal with. And that's why it's perfectly legal. And it's, you know, it's a problem with our, our system, our structure, right? Um, and so, you know, you can talk about a limiting, you know, creating term limits, which for senators and um, like House of Representatives, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. I think that makes sense, right? Um, you know, it's evolved a lot since its conception, right? Mm -hmm. And um, just like, you know, we were talking about before, I mean, I believe it was Madison that said, you know, they recognize the issues that we could have that we're currently experiencing right now. He said, banking establishments are more dangerous than standing armies. They won't only really take your life, they'll take your liberty too, right? Mm -hmm. And why is that, right? I mean, you've talked on the show a lot about what is fiat currency at the end of the day? It's a representation of the value of our labor, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day. And 
um, you know, like, look, <laughs> it, 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 beyond that, it has no value. Hence the reason, right, that because, and I know the crypto people get mad at me, right? And I'm not saying that there isn't any value to the technology, right? But what is it backed by, right? And at this juncture, like you guys are talking about, what, what is our currency really backed by, right? At some point, at some point, what does that all mean, right? So, so when you're talking about, you know, this, this thing that we've created, and it's in the grand scheme of this things, it's not all that old, really, right? It was a blueprint for self-government. Mm -hmm. Right. The, they warned us in Federalist Papers 10 and 51 about factions, which is special interests. Right. They 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 warned us over and over again. And it was Jefferson that we were talking about before that said he wasn't a um, fan of frequent changes in laws and institutions, but they need to evolve. Right. With the progression of the human mind. Otherwise, you're going to make your future ancestors um, like live under the rule of their barbarous ancestors. So they're, they acknowledge that, that it needed to evolve. And let's be honest, has it? Has it really? Has it really? It, 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 there were changes like almost immediately. Like they, you know, they, they realized that you, you know, it didn't make sense to have the vice president be the person who ran against the president. <laughs> You know, but but if the you know I guess my my favorite way of looking at it is um, and I'm a I'm a huge fan of Thoreau but he said that all machines have friction but when the friction comes to have its own machine then you need to let it wear out now that was his argument for civil disobedience I'm not advocating you know for violence I don't think we need it if we use the tools we have at our disposal but and you know I guess I'm a glasses half full type of girl. I think we're a resourceful people, so why not? Mm. It's, it's better than the alternative because I don't know about anyone else, but I know that people have been talking about civil, maybe there's chatter of civil war, there's chatter of this or chatter of that, but do we, do we really want that? You know, I mean, because the, there's certainly things on the rise, theft is on the rise, there's a whole slew of things on the rise that, that aren't healthy for us. And, and I mean, we certainly are more divided than we ever have been before. We right? have, and we've talked in the past about how that's actually been used as a blueprint for politicians to basically keep the masses underneath them mm -hmm. uh, ignorant of what's really going on. It's the old bread and circuses of Rome. Yeah. Uh, provide them, you know, basic food and, and entertainment and the people will ultimately be okay. Yep. you're meeting some of their base needs but that actually doesn't last we saw the fall of rome and the fall of all empires that try to do that the the question yeah. is do we still have a chance here in the u.s to kind of turn things around or does it need to go through some sort of collapse and can we do that just by changing the banking system so if we go back to the original gold and silver standard yeah um does that does that change everything underneath it or do we then have to go back and do and have more political discussion about how we need to modify i will I will say this, I, I think at this juncture, regardless of what someone's stance is on how the, the, the size and scope of government, what it is, right? I, I, I will certainly say that I, I'm, I'm certainly a fan of Jeffersonian pastoralism, right? I, whether or not it makes sense right now, I will say that I'm not sure, I, I'm sure we're gonna need a new monetary system. I mean, but you guys can speak to that more than I can. Um, but we need some constitutional reform. Yes. I mean, I don't, at the very least, at the very least change how campaigns are funded. Right. Um, then we can maybe talk about those other things. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's time, you know, I mean, it's, 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 I, I, I don't, it, it's, it would be like me asking you, Rob, <laughs> to, I, when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen exactly. Uh, gosh, I, I don't know. I, like, I'm, I mean, yeah. I, I, I no know one ever knows the answer to that. Yeah. Even like Nostradamus me. was wrong on a lot of his predictions. Exactly. One of the best. What, what do you guys think, Jim and, and Ian? What are your thoughts on, does, if we go back and fix the money part of the equation, does the rest of the constitutional equation balance or do we have to go back and fix some things with the constitution yeah so so i think the, the first question was you know can can we change things can can we change things can we improve things and can we do it without a collapse i think 
I think the answer to that is no, we can't do it without a collapse. Um, I don't think you know the government or the banking system is going to kind of voluntarily give up on fiat. They're going to keep pushing forward with um, central bank digital currencies. Um, only when that completely fails will they um, you know kind of readopt gold and silver's money. And I was thinking about it. Um, the the government wants fiat, right? Because because then they they can spend whatever they want. Central banks have been done just fine on gold standards. You know, mm-hmm. they, they've been very profitable. So, um, you know, readopting a gold standard, but keeping a central bank, I think would be the worst case scenario. Um, you know, the, it's the central bank that has to go. You know, if you've, if, if you've got gold and silver's money, you don't need a central bank. You can have, you know, smaller banks and compete with your trust. Um, and that, that system work, worked well. It's, it's centralizing that power over money, which is insane, you know. Um, th- th- That's a key point I wanted to interject really quickly. What you said, we did have a banking system much like you described. It was not a central banking system. It was an independent banking system, which actually did very well. What it didn't do is allow the governments to coordinate a response, you know, across the different colonies for purposes of doing armies, and they like to have standing armies. And then each individual state governors for their currencies would blow them up by issuing debt and forcing the banks to carry the debt, which put them at risk. So the banking system became under risk by the governors and and the people that wanted to issue debt and print money. And that's why the banking system failed. It wasn't because that model or that design didn't work. It actually worked quite well. But yeah, so so, so that that kind of fear of the central bank kind of holding on to power somehow, like if you believe fiat's doomed, then you you could say, well, the central, you know, the Fed's toast, et cetera. but that's what scares me about, um, you know, J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, and and their presence in the metals markets. And you know, one kind of conspiracy theory I can see is, you know, if things really fall apart and the and the banks figure we need gold and silver backing, you know, cash settle out SLV, GLD, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, the next day it's it's owned by the banks, banking system. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's that's why I feel it's so important for people to, you know get physic, you know, get their own physical gold and silver and, and kind of get it out of the hands of the banks. But the second my, my, part of it, do you think that more needs to happen other than the, the currency part? Do you think it's an opportunity to go back oh, and I, say, I, let, let's I, improve our existing system? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and and my, my hope is that, you know, as fiat collapses, um, then then that's going to basically dramatically weaken the, the U.S., the federal government. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's going to be a great opportunity for the states. Um, And there's some great liberty uh, loving states um, that are, you know, thinking about this, or at least a significant number of the reps like in New Hampshire are thinking along the lines of, you know, when when stuff happens, we need to be ready to kind of stand Mm -hmm. up and reassert state power. Now, there's going to be states that go down a socialist path, and and I wouldn't want to live in them, but that's okay. Um, You know, as long as we have some states standing up for liberty, that kind of competition between states and that decentralization um, will will be a great thing, um, and and that that's what I'm hoping for. That's why um, when I ran for office, I ran for state senate versus uh, U.S. Congress, is because I felt I could do a lot more and have a lot more impact at the state level, and that that definitely turned out to be true. Hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Do if the big reset happens, the the other side of that coin. If the big reset happens, I think we're all assuming that most of us want to go back to a situation where we're small, our republic, and we get back to more of an originalist view of the Constitution or somewhere in between, you know, what we have today, which is probably corporatism or corporate socialism, whatever you want to call it. But are we, when we go through that, is the train wreck big enough and leave enough wreckage that then we're having to worry about even basic levels of government at that point, for example? I mean, the Great Depression was horrible. It did stress government, but government was not nearly as big back then. And it wasn't a full collapse of our currency back then. We're looking at something different. I, I would argue we're, we're looking at the end of the current dollar dominant system. And we have a much bigger sprawling government with much bigger obligations. Do is essentially, does that provide like a period in which there's it's going to be somewhat chaotic politically and culturally for people trying to survive, not only financially, but uh, just 
services and things like that, people are going to struggle with maybe because the money's not there and the governments aren't capable of providing them. Is there any worry about that this time? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's going to be, you know, if this happens, um, it's going to be painful. Mm. Um, I, I think it 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 opens up a better path in on the other side of it, but it'll be mm. painful. And but that's that's what your show is so good at is is kind of explaining that to people and how you can be prepared for that so that mm. you know it may be painful for a lot of people, but you can protect yourself um, from it. Um, but uh, what was I going to say? Something. Um, yeah. So the. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Okay, no worries. Over to Ian. What's your thought on what it would look like if this system hard resets? That that mandates banking holidays. It mandates, you know, temporary non-access to things like ATMs, basic services like wires. Uh, that's going to be hard in today's world in which so much is dependent upon electronic communication, electronic banking. Yeah, I mean, hence... The, what does that system look like? We don't know. Um, there isn't... Well, I mean, let me rewind a bit just to the word reset and the big reset. Mm -hmm. We are being reset. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even matter if there's not one big dramatic collapse, finale, kaboom. Um, we are in a slow motion train wreck. Mm -hmm. And... Do you think it'll be a smooth handover? Ian, no, I don't think, issues, it's, I do you think? don't think. No, I don't think it's going to be smooth, but we can only play the course in front of us mm -hmm. as it's revealed to us and as we learn more. And even the, our enemies, the central bank, the leading financiers, they, they don't fully know what's going to happen either. Um, it's not going to go all their way either. So I think to be really agile is crucial at this time. To, to reduce your exposure to things that um, tie you down if you can. I'm a bit like what you've done, Rob, you've pretty well, you're pretty well mobile now. You're, you're in a good position to, mm -hmm. to react. And whereas most people aren't, are they in America? I don't know what statistics are, but probably 70% are paycheck to paycheck. Mm -hmm. If they don't turn up for work and get their paycheck at the end of the week or two weeks, they're bankrupt. So most people aren't even in a position to, to step off, step out of the train wreck. So it's, like, it's working out what we can do to be less reset, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and again, that is resorting to primary wealth. It's getting out of the ludicrous theoretical wealth in the bond market and in stocks. And I would even say in crypto, and again, it's going to upset some people, but it's theoretical wealth till you turn into something you can eat or drive or live in or mm -hmm. ride on if it's a horse. It's theoretical. And the figures just don't add up. 100 trillion in the US bond market, 20 trillion money supply, digital money supply. So, so that can't go to cash. So therefore, no, it can. And that's why when you have collapses, they tend to be big collapses. Big. Yeah. And like we've seen this year, we've had a big collapse, especially in NASDAQ, for example, in the tech sector, even though all that money didn't just disappear. And, and we know why uh, it, it was put out in a book. A good friend of mine wrote a book uh, on this, the Ponzi factor. And he wrote, you know what? Only 1% of stocks trade every day, but the valuations for the entire complex moves. So you get 100 to 1 either increase yeah. in the market on a good day or 100 to 1 decrease on a bad day. Yeah. So it's like riding a lower coast, riding a roller coaster with jetpacks on. Yeah, you're going to hit the peaks and valleys a lot faster, and it's going to yeah. be a lot more painful because you you can't have a hundred trillion stock market like you said with only twenty trillion print ever printed, and also have a hundred trillion bond market, hundred yeah. trillion real estate market. You can that, and on and on, and, and then you add the the quadrillion. The, yeah. Was it three quadrillion worldwide debt now? I think it's three quadrillion, and and. and uh, I, Rafi Farber did an excellent post. I don't know if you guys have seen it. He overlaid the Federal Reserve's balance sheet with an exponential curve. It matches it perfectly. Mm -hmm. And every time they step away from that exponential curve, everything starts collapsing. But you can't mm -hmm. keep increasing the money supply and increasing the theoretical value of things exponentially because it has to collapse. So we can either just let it collapse 
i.e. the Fed pivoting and, and you know, or it, it, whatever the Fed does, it's going to collapse and collapse dramatically. So let's step forward. Let's say we agree with that. There's going to be a collapse. And when I argue collapse of the financial system, it's going to have repercussions outside the financial system. Yeah. Which is one reason I wanted to have Jennifer on to talk about that. So Jennifer, what happens in collapsing financial systems to societies with, you know, just safety, security, rights, government assistance, mm -hmm. things like that, you know, in the history, in history, when you can't have basic finance or basic commerce using an established mm -hmm. system, what happens to the levers of government? Well, it's, it's very difficult to compare right now to what has happened in the past mm -hmm. exactly because you're talking about a world that let's let's all like think i mean i remember being in college and facebook was brand new and it really hasn't been that long that we've been like no. as digital i mean we're close to the same age rob i didn't have a cell phone in high school mm -hmm. Right. Like, I mean, and there was the whole Snowden, you know, thing there's like, but like, you know, they're talking about, you know, like what, how long has they, been, how long have they been tracking us on our cell phones, for example. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, and, and when I say that, like, are they really like tracking me? The one way that I'm going to tell you to, that I'm going to look at it and think about it um, is because there's going to be a lot of variables that play into what happens with regards to like our social system and then the institutions mm -hmm. related to our social system that are um, going to determine how that evolves. And I, I know we all joke here and I know you guys think I'm a little mad, but let's, let's just be really honest with each other. We're all a little mad here, right? So, I, but I'm an ultra marathoner, right? I run a hundred miles. I can't go into a hundred mile race just thinking about the finish line because you, you can't, you can't, you have to run the mile you're in, right? Mm -hmm. Like a hundred miles is a long ways away, a long, 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 long ways away from the start. And yes, where we're at right now, we have some real issues. I'm, I'm not going to deny that at all. Um, does that mean that there, if we were strategic and we were resourceful, that there aren't mechanisms in the, this blueprint that we have that we couldn't use to fix it? Yeah, absolutely. It's a blueprint for self-government, right? Um, and so I think, you know, like we we had a referendum candidate when run against Trump and Clinton that would have resolved like some of the issues that are are currently impacting. It's, um, you know, the, the system that really the dysfunction in the current system, but we didn't elect them, right? If the, their, their timing was off maybe, right? His name was, was Lawrence Lessig. Um, but what I will say is like, look, yes, historically, what has happened? Well, I, there's a lot of crazy things that could happen. I don't know why did why did we why did we why do we have a constitutional convention? Well, this isn't the only factor, but let's face it. Um, you know, bankers foreclosed on a guy uh, named William Shazland when he fought in the Revolutionary War. And what did he do? He went into town and shot the bankers. <laughs> it's called Shays Rebellion, right? Uh, you know. I do I think that there could be rebellions? Yeah, that, I mean, what like we've what what have we seen? What strange things have we seen in the past two years that we never thought we would see? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, but the the one thing I would also say is people are resourceful and um, we're a melting pot <laughs> of, of different types of people in this country. And I grew up on a 160 acre horse and sheep ranch in the middle of nowhere in Eastern Oregon. And uh, my dad, yeah, I mean, he could go off the grid and nobody would ever find him. <laughs> you know, I, like, so I think, I think the one thing that, that I, I have a lot of, I guess I would call it faith in is that Never underestimate the capacity of humans. Mm -hmm. Never underestimate the capacity of humans. Yeah, I'd we say are. that's definitely true. I'd say there have been a lot of tragedies in the past in which people have banded together. Uh, yeah. And I would even say during the Great Depression, during the last really big economic issue, yeah. people really did try to help each other as much as they could. It was just 
yes the, the system was broken didn't provide enough for everybody and you know had to make really tough choices um and i think that's going to happen again i think it's going to be an individual decision as to how you handle it but there are probably certain precepts and things that are good ideas to think about ahead of time and one of the reasons i want to have this discussion is to get people thinking about those things it's not just the financial yeah. preparations that you make you need to understand what could be somewhat chaotic in and around everyday right. life a lack of social mm -hmm. services um people not being available lack of supplies things like that and that's something definitely when we've talked to people who have lived mm -hmm. through currency crisis elsewhere that's definitely something that that comes up I any last I'm... thoughts from from you ian before yeah, we wrap right. up on the subject of liberty and, and not just with regards to financial liberty but you know what do yeah. we need going forward for liberty here in the u.s yeah it's a great opportunity um mm -hmm. because globalization and the financialization has led to an extreme division of labor mm -hmm. so that complex system is breaking down e even now um you know some things are impossible to get hold of or it's a, a year i was just at a friend's house and they ordered some stuff for christmas last year it's just arrived so the, the division of labor is breaking down. So what does that mean? That means if we're going to survive and thrive, we need to start doing more different things. We've got to learn different skills. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not going to presume we can just do one thing anymore. Um, whatever it is. Um, so maybe a hobby needs to become more, more prominent. I mean, I've shifted career from construction into precious metals. I don't think it will stop there. I'm learning to grow stuff. I've dug my front yard up. Um, mm -hmm. And that brings community because people stop and talk to you. Um, we're, we're getting a dog this afternoon, partly for security, partly for fun. So that's a whole new world for me. Never had a dog. <laughs> so, but yeah, so there's lots of good things in a, in a simpler way of life just to to remove that extreme division of labor because it tends to isolate people if you're stuck in an office mm -hmm. just pressing one button doing one thing or you're in a factory making one widget and you have no idea what it does you sort of lose purpose lose meaning almost mm -hmm. um so yes i totally agree with you jennifer this is an amazing country amazing melting pot and if we can individually and community wise just build up alternative society that will make the central banks irrelevant that will make all this dictatorship irrelevant because they can go play with their ball and you know but they'll find it harder and harder for people to service their lifestyle because their names and faces are, are actually being put up in europe they're putting up the pictures of Klaus schwab and all of the all of, all of the wef people um they're putting posters up of them saying wanted now i'm not <laughs> saying we, we should go lynch them but let's keep naming them you know so jerome powell you know, you're not doing good for this country i don't like what you're doing will you stop it <laughs> janet yellen <laughs> biden all of you just just go home we will get on a <laughs> Anyway, that's probably enough of my, my, my rant, I guess. Any any last thoughts, Jim? Just on the subject, not only monetary freedom, but given the situation we're dealing with in the U.S. today. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of preparedness, um, definitely. I mean, there's there's a lot of things you can live without, right? But but food's not one of them. So so that that's probably the highest priority. And you know, learn how to farm or get to know a farmer. You know, you don't you don't have to do everything yourself, but, you know, make friends with uh, people in the community, get some dried food, um, hopefully never need it. But, you know, um, you know, because there's there's not a whole lot of food in the grocery stores. Right. It's like three days for the community or one week. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so definitely um, make sure you have those things. on. But but I, I want to echo your comments, Jennifer, that that, um, you know, most people are good and most and there's a lot of ingenuity. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the banking system could completely collapse. Um, you know, they, they tried to scare us last time saying, oh, you're going to go to the ATM and money is not going to come out. And so therefore, we need to do these bailouts. Don't don't buy off on that again to yeah. say, no, that's OK. If the ATM doesn't work out, you know, we'll, you know, we'll barter with each other or something. Um, and that was a lie anyway. Um, so so no, I think I think we can we can get through this. Um, just make sure to be prepared as well as you can help each other out.
All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining the panel. I, I think it was a really good discussion, probably what the first of what should be many for people going forward in their own families and in their own communities. Because uh, definitely, uh, we think financially it's going to get a lot tougher, and that's going to put some strains on uh, you know, our lifestyle and what we expect to happen going forward. So definitely good to have those. Thank you, everybody, for joining the program. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.